So first of all, Happy New Year. It's 2026, and it's time to figure out if motion capture is going to get completely replaced by generative AI. So for some context, what I'm talking about here is creating linear content with 3D characters and rendering that out using motion capture or really animation in general. When we're talking about 3D animation and mocap for video games, that's pretty safe for now anyway. That's a 3D process that needs 3D animation. And the technology I'm gonna be talking about today doesn't really play in that space. This is really more about linear content. So specifically today, I'm gonna to be comparing using motion capture and really like the highest in motion capture you can do uh, in creating linear content in Unreal Engine versus using generative AI with similar source material to again, create linear content. And this will all make sense once you see the examples. So to start, here is what pretty high-end motion capture looks like when used with MetaHumans in Unreal Engine 5.7.1. Today, I'm going to be talking about the differences between generative AI and traditional 3D motion capture that I'm doing today. This is still like in the grand scheme of things a relatively new workflow, but if you've been in VFX or game development, this core technology has been around for quite a while. However, there's this new technology. I can't even say it's on the horizon. It is just right here, closer than the horizon in our laps. And that is, of course, generative AI. AI. So the results are pretty good. I guess I'm biased because I created them and I like Unreal Engine and MetaHumans and all that stuff, but we have pretty accurate representation of motion of the body, the face, the lip syncs working pretty well, and in Unreal Engine it's easy enough to light it and to make content with it. What I'm going to do now is take the video of the body, right? So while I was recording this mocap, I recorded what's called a witness camera, which is just a video of me doing the performance. This is so I can check the audio sync. If there's something weird with the mocap, what did I actually do? This is sort of the ground truth of mocap as a witness camera. And we normally film this during most professional sessions. But what you can do with Kling motion control is take that body animation that's just video and apply that to a different image. So what I did is I took a still from that video and then I used Google Nana Banana to change me into a different outfit, a white t-shirt, uh, white shorts, white sneakers, and put me in a white studio. So we have our starting frame, which exactly matches the first frame of the video. And we add this together in Kling with their new motion control feature. And this is what the output looks like. Today, I'm going to be talking about the differences between generative AI and traditional 3D motion capture that I'm doing today. Today, I'm going to be talking about the differences between generative AI and traditional 3D motion capture that I'm doing today. So to me, this is still overall impressive, but not quite production ready in, in this example specifically. So first of all, when you match the frame, the first frame to the video, it does a really good job of matching the body motion. A pretty good job, right? Um, the camera's not moving. There is motion blur in the original video that makes it hard for it. But overall, the motion body to body, I would give it like a seven, a six, something like that, right? But when it comes to the face, the issue is, of course, that the, the face in the video is this little tiny box, and there's not enough resolution for it to do the motion capture of the face, the lip sync, correctly. So the face gets like, you know, the overall motion and like the mouth kind of moving. It does an okay job, but it's getting somewhere like a three out of 10 for me. It's, it's, it's not even close to usable. For my next test, and this one's a little bit, you know, cooked. It's not the perfect example, but I basically took the head cam footage from the Rococo head camera that I was using for mocap, and I put that and applied it to a medium shot that I generated of me again in a white t-shirt on a white studio. In this case, the video is super close to my face. We should have enough resolution for the mouth. Uh, and let's see what it looks like when we apply that to our uh, AI-generated medium shot. Today, I'm going to be talking about the differences between generative AI and traditional 3D motion capture that I'm doing today. Today, I'm going to be talking about the differences between generative AI and traditional 3D motion capture that I'm doing today. Okay, so this one's kind of a meme and a joke. So obviously the shoulders are going absolutely crazy in it. And it sort of makes sense if you look at them side by side is that the camera is mounted to my head. And every time I move my head, 
to the video, it looks like my shoulders are moving. So it applies the head rotation to the shoulders in the generated AI video from Click Motion Control. I don't fault it that. It's basically bad source uh, material. You shouldn't use a head mounted camera. Good to know. Don't use a head mounted camera and move your head around for, you know, cling motion control unless you want some funny uh, shoulder dancing. However, so for the body, of course, it's like a zero out of 10 or it's, it's funny, but it's, it's not usable at all. But I will say when we have a video that's that close to the face that the lip sync is actually pretty good. So for the final test that I did here is showing how um, cling motion control should be used. It's how most examples that you see on the internet are presented. But I wanted to show this kind of like process of testing it to sort of show you the best way of using it. So instead of using the wide shot from my mocap camera and the close up from my mocap face camera, I just filmed myself pretty much like this, just a medium shot sitting and talking to camera. I then took again the first frame of that video, did a little AI to it. I gave myself a new haircut, put myself in a new background, changed my lighting, new outfit, etc. And that's kind of the fun part. And then put the still image and the source video into Kling Motion Control, and this is what we get. Today I'm going to be talking about the differences between generative AI and traditional mocap like I'm doing right now. Today I'm going to be talking about the differences between generative AI and traditional mocap like I'm doing right now. So that is the best results that you're going to be getting, I think, from Kling Motion Control. Again, you can be doing a wide shot where they don't talk and it's going to do the motion pretty well. Um, and then if you mix that with medium shots where it's people talking and the source image is very still, right? It has to be a locked off shot so that it can figure out the motion. And it's close enough that it can see and have enough resolution on the lips that it can transfer lip sync and the body motion. And it's pretty convincing overall. So what is the takeaway from this experiment? Well, that completely depends on who you are what type of resources you have access to and what you're trying to produce, like obviously, but I'll, I'll frame this from my point of view. So when it comes to creating films, usually of things that don't exist or they're a little bit like fantastical, that has been kind of like the bulk of the mocap work I do as a freelancer for other companies. This uh, current iteration of generative AI motion control does not replace yet motion capture for metahumans in Unreal Engine, and I'll, I'll explain why. I know I'm like protecting my own company, but I, I just want to kind of say what I'm thinking from from this as well. So the the fact that you can't use a wide shot of someone moving and talking is problematic. That's what I wanted to win, because what we need to do for most films is make a performance happen somehow, right? And then we need to be able to film it from different angles and light it, and there's client revisions. This whole process has client revisions where the performance needs to stay stable and work from any angle. With the current generation of um, you know, generative AI mocap, it doesn't really, you can't really quite do that yet. Now, if you could combine the wide shot of the body and the face, of the, you know, for the facial mocap and like accurately map those to like the generative uh, video, which I, I think I saw Corridor Digital doing something like that. But anyway, it doesn't exist for Kling. I don't know how to do it yet. That might be the fix is that you have a video of the wide shot, again, a video of the face, just like we do for mocap, and that could drive the character from any distance, then we'd be in a good place. What I will say though, is that Again, this requires for 3D to be kind of of a similar quality of just generative AI video to video, it requires a lot of hardware, a lot of skills, and, and, and honestly, more people, right? So my job is usually the full specialist, the mocap specialist. I run the whole mocap system. I'm the performer sometimes. Other times I have other performers. And it, it just requires a lot of people. And then someone is making the sets and rendering it and lighting and directing it and doing all the VFX stuff. It's like, it's a lot of people. It's the normal VFX pipeline. Where compared to if you're going to just execute something video to video and you can work within the constraints of how Kling motion control works and you can get away with doing, you know, 10 second relatively low resolution output videos, which I do think there's a lot of use cases where that would be fine. That can be done with one person. You could just film yourself, switch out the character, have whatever background you want. You don't have to 3D model it. You just prompt it. And that is 
that is freeing in a lot of ways. And although the quality and the resolution is just not there yet today, it is certainly fun. And I think that there's probably some projects where that might be the right approach. But does this technology replace, you know, motion capture for games? Obviously not. That's 3D for 3D. Does it replace it for most CG films? Not quite. Not yet. I think that, you know, in time, this will get better and better, and you might find certain shots and certain scenes and projects it'll work. But I do think for 2026, the same people that were producing cinematics, you know, with precision, the high quality, who are using motion capture for, you know, for 3D, I, I think that that's still going to be the move for most cases. However, we're all going to just keep experimenting and testing to the point where, like, perhaps it is more practical to do it the full generative AI way. We have more control and we have more quality. I just don't see that yet, but I am still going to keep testing all of the new generative AI models that are coming out. And when it's relevant to the Unreal Engine MetaHuman 3D community, I'll be posting those videos here on Cinematography Database. But when I'm just doing pure generative AI video to video or just full prompting craziness, that will be happening at the Workman Labs YouTube channel, again, linked in the comments below. So that wraps it up for this video. I feel like I both represent the like established entrenched 3D industry, but also the kind of emerging generative AI uh, industry at the same time. And sometimes my brain doesn't know which side to pick, but I keep running these tests. I'm obviously very curious to see where this technology evolves, but I still think for my day job in 2026, I'm going to be doing a lot of MetaHuman mocap because that's sort of where the control and the quality in the established pipeline is. But who knows? Did I miss something? Let me know in the comments. I'm just really interested in discussing this topic. And if you've, you know, new results and new tests uh, in this space, I, I'm all ears. I'd love to hear it. And I'll see you on the next video.